I'm going to introduce, uh, yes, but I think I need maybe one hour to introduce yes, because he, he has a big background. So I, I just uh, have five minutes. So I, I'm going to do it very quickly. So uh, yes, Volersen is a professor at, of environmental and engineering at Aalborg University in Denmark. Uh, uh, yes, also worked in public and private companies and was uh, strongly involved in the urban water sector. Uh, I, I think that gives to, to Yes a pragmatic view of urban water management. Uh, his research topics uh, bring key findings on biological and chemical processes and pollutants in urban drainage systems, including sewer systems and stormwater systems. Um, I think uh, his approach is to develop fundamental knowledge to solve real life problems and to bring this knowledge to deal with field scale and real case studies. Uh, yes, investigations on macroplastic began, I think, in 2015, uh, particularly on analytical methods for microplastic quantification. Um, I think YES performs a great job to contribute to fast and affordable methods to quantify microplastic in various uh, receiving water bodies. Uh, his work targets all types of compartment hydro systems and metrics such as uh, water, wastewater, food, soil, sediment, and so on. Um, my view is that the purpose of uh, YES research is to quantify sources and occurrence of environmental microplastic and address to to, to, to the process behind the mitigation technologies and strategies. Um, I think also that YES addresses aspect of the physical, chemical, and biological breakdown of uh, microplastic in the environment. So um, we are really pleased to have you, uh, YES, as speaker today. So please, the floor is yours for 40 minutes. Go ahead. Thank you, Kislan. 40 minutes, dot, dot. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I'll, try, I'll try to manage because, uh, you know, when I first get starting, started talking, uh, one never knows when I end. Um, <clears throat> so um, as Kislan says, this is about quantifying microplastics in the environment. And uh, as was also pretty clear from his presentation of, of, of me and my background, meaning, meaning uh, I did not start my, my, my life as a microplastic researcher because uh, it is a very no, new research field. Um, when, uh, uh, how did all this study and all this focus in microplastic actually start? This is a, um, a list of publications uh, and uh, some of site citations per year on uh, articles in Web of Science, which have uh, microplastics in the, in the abstract or heading or something like that. <clears throat> so you can see in the beginning, there was very little. And the beginning we typically uh, call uh, yeah, 2004, where there was a science article by Richard, Richard Thompson, which was called Lost at Sea, Where's All the Plastics? And uh, uh, Richard figured out that uh, all the plastics that is coming to the, to the, to the coastlines, um, where, where, where is it actually disappearing to? Why do we uh, find what we find and why do we not find more? And uh, for the next 10 years, basically, very little happened. So, so very little uh, research was done in this topic for, for 10 years, and nobody knew about it, right? So, uh, uh, but, but 
around maybe year 2014, 15 or something like that, there started to come a focus on the microplastics. And um, the first studies, the way they analyzed for microplastics uh, was by uh, collecting a sample, for example, a sand sample from, from the strand line from the beach, and uh, then uh, prepared density separation uh, using uh, some simple salts like sodium chloride or something like that, and uh, then picking out potential plastic candidates uh, under the microscope and analyzing using Fourier transform infrared uh, spectroscopy typically. Uh, this technique, FTIR, is, is a very old, very well-known technique that can tell you which material uh, it is that you have, that you're looking at, especially when they're organic materials. And this was the gold standard for quite some years. And uh, it is still a method that many people use, meaning this, this uh, sorting through, uh, through a sample, picking out the, the, the plastics and analyzing them. Um, but how you analyze uh, depends on, on uh, what you want to get out of it. And uh, different people want to get different things out of it. Maybe you as a researcher want to uh, understand where does the plastic come from? So this would, uh, uh, mean that you would have to look at it in one way. Or maybe you are may mainly interested in the size distribution and which section, which part of the size distribution are you interested in? Are you interested in the big parts or the small parts or maybe even the nanos? And this means you have to analyze in completely different ways. So uh, back to this uh, common approach in the early studies, what you did was uh, a simple volume reduction, for example, filtration or, or density separation, and uh, then identify it using the microscope uh, based on uh, if it looked like a plastic piece of plastic, right? And what looks like a piece of plastic, yeah, it, it, it has some morphology and some colors, which, which are characteristics, at least some of them have. And then you counted it. And uh, this uh, has typically, uh, being done in size ranges above maybe half a millimeter or something like that. Um, and uh, the thing is that if you do this, uh, this is quite okay if you have big particles. I mean, if you have something which is a millimeter in size, you can see reasonably well if it's plastic or not. But if it's a hundred micrometers, uh, forget it. It is, it is really, really impossible to see under a microscope. Uh, what it what it is and what is not. If I take some of you who have never seen, never done this, and and let them look at different small particles, you will probably pick out the shiny plastic, the shiny particles, and these will tend to be uh, those, for example, quartz particles, inorganic particles. I tried that once with some students, and that was pretty much fun. And they picked out all the wrong particles. So uh, since then, analytical methods have, di have diversified and improved quite a lot. And this is just a, a slide that shows how, how, how much is in it and how, how many, uh, what, what people typically are doing. So you typically take a sample and you divert it, uh, divide it into large particles, whatever that is, and small particles, whatever that is. And then you use different techniques uh, for your infrared transformation, Raman typically. Uh, you would also use pyrolysis DCMS, meaning uh, or TET DCMS, which is a similar thing to pyrolysis. And then you can quantify how many particles you have, how big they are, and what sizes and what mass they have. Uh, these different techniques uh, have different size resolution because uh, what sizes are we really interested in? Uh, yeah, it depends, right? But if you're interested in toxicity, you will typically be interested in the small particles. The smaller the particles, the higher the potential impact. Uh, I mean, if, you, if, you, if, if a fish meets a rubber boot uh, out in the ocean, uh, the, the, the probability of it eating the rubber boot and digesting it is very small. But if it meets a, a one millimeter sized particle or a hundred micrometer sized particle, ingesting it uh, is much more likely and uh, also the potential harm increases when, when, when the particles get smaller as they might translocate 
uh, over the the cell membrane. Uh, sorry, the, the intestine intestine membranes. Uh, uh, in worst case, so. Um, um, most of the plastics that have been uh, been been reported, oh sorry, most of the studies that have been reported has reported plastics in terms of numbers. How many particles do you have? Uh, this is a really really difficult uh, thing to operate with, because I mean, how many pieces of sand is on the beach, right? Uh, it depends on the size. Uh, let me let me give you an example. If you take a particle which is uh, one millimeter uh, one millimeter big, and you give it a uh, a hammer with your metrical uh, a, a hammer it with your metrical hammer, uh, and make ten micrometer particles out of it, you end up having a million particles. So the number of 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 uh, particles that you create changes as you met, as your plastic breaks down. So, uh, so, so uh, the number of particles is not a uh, consistent and reproducible number. There is no conservation law for, uh, for, for numbers of particles. There is, however, a conservation law for mass, because the mass should stay the same, even though you give the big piece of plastic one with your hammer. So, uh, so, so, so it is. It is important also to, uh, to 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 have the mass there, but the mass is not enough. As I said, also just before, you also need the sizes, because uh, the sizes matters matters for the ecotoxicology, uh, also for transport and phase studies and so on. So you need, in reality, both the mass and the numbers and the size distributions of the particle of the microplastics. So um, when this is said, there was very early on a, a, a cry for standardization in the microplastic uh, research field. Uh, it, started, it was first really mentioned strongly by in 2016 by the GP Ocean Project Baseman, uh, which, which recognized that uh, uh, we are not able to uh, uh, to uh, have a systematic and, and uh, comparable analysis of plastics. And that was in 2016. So people tried to see, could we somehow do a um, consistent analysis of our plastics so we could, so that, that I can measure something and you can measure, measure something and then we can compare the results. This turned out to be much more difficult uh, than 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 uh, the, the consortium uh, back back in those times had thought, and we still haven't really succeeded in doing this for various reasons. So um, one of the reasons is: do we really need standardization, uh, or better, when do we need standardization? I would say that if you're doing research like I do, uh, I would not. I don't need standardization because I'm always pushing the boundaries and pushing the borders of, 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 of knowledge and, and, and standardization in my analytical methods would more hamper my process than, 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 than help them. But, but if I would look at monitoring, for example, how much plastics is there in the sea, how much in the ocean sediments, how much is, 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 is there in, in the Mediterranean compared to the North Sea or whatnot, then I need to have a standardized approach. So for monitoring, uh, it is needed. So uh, when this is said, uh, there still are several issues with the standardization. Because when you're standardizing something, you have to have a consensus on the best way to analyze. And we are not there yet. We do not agree, uh, uh, like in the whole microplastic community, the big community, how this actually should be done. There's my way and there's your way. And I'm pretty sure my way is better than your way. But, uh, uh, but there's a lot of discussions going on there. And again, part of this is there are different objectives when you're analyzing. Why do you analyze? What do you want to get out of it? Which informations do you want to get out of it? And that governs how you analyze. And uh, another thing that has uh, in practice been seen to affect the standardization method quite a lot is that uh, some people say that microplastics analysis should be affordable for all. 
and uh, and some people say no you need to have high high end quality equipment in order to do this in order to get reliable results so the affordability issue is also something that that is important when you try to figure out if you sh uh, how to how to how to standardize and discussion also about what is actually good enough when you are doing monitoring uh, what is the the balance between value and effort so uh, this has been discussed for a long time and is still being discussed and there is no agreement on uh, how this should be uh, be done in reality however when this is said we still need trustworthy analysis because because we we need to be able to uh, to uh, assess what is in the environment we in, need to be able to dis distinguish between uh, sources and uh, we need to uh, quantify impacts. And uh, we are, of course, getting much better at this. Uh, and and uh, we know today what is a good idea to do when you analyze and what is not a good idea to do when you analyze. So slowly, 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 there is developing a consensus on how you should do this. And this will then ultimately, of course, also leads to some standardization. OK, Whew. let's start from the beginning, maybe. What we have to do when we analyze is to get from a system, which could be the marine environment you see here, this is some of the Danish waters, to a quantification. And, uh, uh, and this, uh, this quantification can, can, uh, it means you have to have some numbers and some masses and some polymer composition and so on. So what you see here on this is, is a study we did in Greenland where we measured uh, microplastics in, in the, in the, in the, out of the, the capital of Nuuk, which, uh, which uh, is, is polluting its environment quite, quite heavily with wastewater because they don't have any treatment. Uh, so, so you actually find comparatively high microplastic concentrations close to the city because they discharge uh, 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 untreated wastewater and they also have a high fishing activity, which also gives you a lot of plastics. And, and such a fingerprint we can clearly see uh, when we study it. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm digressing. I'll go back to what I was talking about. So, uh, so uh, when we want to analyze for in a certain system, we have to uh, use a, an appropriate method for sampling. That is the first thing. If you go back to the Greenland study, we, co we, we collected one cubic meter of water per sample, for example, because the concentrations, I'm just going back to it now, you can see here, they, they, are, they are pretty low. So, uh, so if, you, if, you, if, you, uh, if you want to find so low concentrations, you have to analyze and concentrate a large, amount of volu large volume of water. So after you have, you have uh, sampled in an appropriate way, you have to extract the microplastics out of the, out of the matrix. And some matrices are easier than other. If you have a, a bucket full of mud, like uh, you see here, it's pretty tough to get the microplastics out of it. <clears throat> and then when you have concentrated them and get gotten rid of all the natural materials, you have to quantify and characterize the extracted plastics and report them in a sensible way. And uh, some, some, uh, some, uh, some uh, matrices are, as I said, more difficult than others. Uh, one, in some matrices, the concentrations is very low. Uh, for example, drinking water, where you, uh, where you, we, we analyzed uh, in drinking water in, in, for example, in Sweden, where we uh, had to collect, I think, it was three cubic meters uh, for one sample in order to to just get enough to be able to analyze it. And uh, in other matrices, there is, is much other stuff than microplastics. Actually, in most matrices, there's much other stuff than microplastics, and you have to get rid of it before you analyze. And, and, uh, and finally, you do not know how, how homogeneously your plastics is distributed in your sample and so on. And of course, contamination. You are really fighting the contamination issues when you are when you're analyzing for plastics, because the contamination issue. Think about it. Everything around you is plastic. You are looking into a computer screen, and know what? It's made of plastics. And you're typing on your on your keyboard. It's also made of plastic. Much of the clothes you have on is made of plastic. 
So, so plastics are everywhere and, and, and you cannot avoid it. So when you're analyzing for it, contamination with your own plastics is a high risk as in, and really one of the arts to avoid. So let's just uh, say say a little bit about who, how we, for example, sample uh, here in Olborg. It's not only Olborg. This is a very common method. For example, marine waters, uh, you typically use nets. This is a manta net where you pull the net through the water surface and then you collect plastics typically over 300 micrometer. And then you analyze them uh, manually uh, uh, using a, a sorting and picking and uh, analyzing simple particle approach. You can also go uh, go uh, into this uh, more detailed uh, uh, using a pump filtration system of which we have developed several. And what you see here is, is a lake up in, on, on, on uh, Lofoten, uh, Norwegian islands, some Norwegian islands. And, and here we have filters, so typically 10 micrometer filters in it. And then we maybe filter a cubic meter. And then you have, uh, have, have the filters down here. And on these filters, we have some material. And this material we then analyze for plastics. Um, we also uh, measure in, in, in deeper waters uh, where we have, uh, in this case, built another system. We call it the Kraken. Which we, uh, which we can hoist into the water to different depths. And then we uh, pump uh, large amounts of water through similar filters like this. And then we collect the, uh, the particles uh, on the filters and analyze them. So, so it is, it can be uh, rather easy like the Mantanet or quite difficult like the Kraken, depending on, uh, on, 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 on what you actually want to sample. So, um, when you're analyzing, we ideally want to find all the microplastics in the sample, and we often want to find the plastics down to a rather low size. As I indicated before, maybe 10 micrometers was our goal uh, with the filters. So, uh, and, and for, for the particles we find, we want to know the characteristics of each and every microplastics. And we want to avoid calling a particle for a plastic if it is not, and we want to avoid uh, overlooking a plastic particle. And this is pretty, pretty, pretty tough, but this is what we ideally want. And we want to avoid contamination and it also has to be cheap and fast. Unfortunately, we cannot get it all because many of these things are in conflict, which is other. So, so, uh, so especially the fast and cheap is in conflict with the rest. So uh, we have to find some appropriate middle ground. What this middle ground is depends, of course, on what you want to do. Uh, and, and, and some of the issues we have seen in, in microplastic analysis is that people have been analyzing without thinking about uh, how well they actually analyzed, what size limit they could analyze down to, and not really done uh, sufficient quality insurance. So, so uh, what is very important is that when we quantify, we quantify correctly down to whatever target we have set. If it's, if it's a millimeter or half a millimeter, fine and good. Then we have to just state that and, and prove we can do it. If we're quantifying down to 10 micrometers or even lower, we have to show that we're actually able to quantify that. And this has not been common in microplastics. So what is well known from analytical chemistry that you have to, to prove what you actually do has not been common in microplastic analysis, but is slowly becoming more and more and more uh, routine and required that people do this. I'll show this with some examples. Uh, let's go hunting for microplastics. So uh, uh, Christian and Alvise here, they found, they found a plastic particle. Oh, but did they actually find them all? Uh, what if they looked a bit deeper with the finer filter? Did they then find more? Oh yes, oh yes, they will. Because just think about the geometry of the game, as I also talked about earlier. If you give your, your plastic particle one with your magical hammer, you create many, 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 many particles. So if you, if you, if you, if you cr crash a one millimeter particle and make a one micrometer particles out of it, you have a billion microplastic particles. So of course there are many, many, many more small particles than big particles. 
Hence, the smaller particles you are able to see or quantify, the more you'll find. This is also why it has been very, it's, it's sort of dodgy to report microplastics in numbers only, because this means that you have to be sure of your size quantification limit, of your lower size quantification limit, and, 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 and people are not really always sure of that, or quite often not sure of that. So, uh, uh, and also this thing is, what is actually your size quantification limit is difficult uh, to, 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 to get at. So uh, it's, a, it's, 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 it's an easy question to ask, but a difficult one to answer. So uh, further in this example, a common approach for analyzing the microplastics was uh, was, as I said, this sorting and picking approach where you look through a batch of whatever, pick the particles out, the nice particles you see on the right, everybody can see those plastics, and you analyze them for the polymer composition. But uh, you might be cherry picking your results because uh, you've been fishing in, in, in the sample and fished something out which you thought was plastics. And, and you have no proof you found all the particles. You, you, you found some for sure, but do you, did you find all? I mean, the bigger the particles are, the more sure you can actually be that you did find all, but, but for the smaller particles, it gets increasingly more difficult. And what is actually the quantification limit in terms of size for this? It's really difficult to figure out and people strongly disagree on it. One thing is sure, the fact that you find one particle of a certain small size does not prove you find them all, right? As we say in Danish, even a blind hen sometimes finds a grain. So, so uh, the fact that you have filtered on a certain filter size or that you found a very small particle does not mean that this is your quantification limit. So, uh, so, 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 so this is something that most people have been overlooking when they have reported the data, this issue about what is actually the limit of, of detection, no, sorry, the limit of quantification, because it's not the smallest detectable particle, right? It's the smallest particle size you can quantify it to, which we're interested in. Uh, and this has very seldom been reported in the literature. Um, so, if you use a more refined approach, uh, like we, for example, do here in Olbock and many other places, by the way, <clears throat> you would still treat your sample to remove most, most of the matrix. You would uh, deposit your, your concentrate uh, on a window or a filter. You would um, scan, analyze the surface, typically with FTIR or Raman, mainly FTIR and to a lesser degree Raman, but Raman is, is coming strongly in now also as a, as a, as a, as a strong method. Uh, or you could also use pyrolysis DCMS to quantify it. So this leads for sure to finding more plastics. But did you find them all? I mean, it's a really a long way from this bucket of mud to the concentrate. This is the concentrate that we analyze on our fancy machines, right? Fancy, expensive, big, heavy machines. Uh, so, 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 so to get all the plastics out here is, 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 is quite tough. Uh, and then we also have to do this analysis, which is actually also pretty tough. So we deposit these small things here, the, the particle, the plastics in, in small vials under this uh, scanning uh, FTR microscope, and then we get a lot of data out of it. A scan like this uh, is shown here, 10 times 10 millimeters is about 3.2 million individual spectra that we, that we get when we're doing a scan like this. And then we have to interpret it. And, uh, and um, for, for, this, for this purpose, we have built our own software, by the way, uh, because, uh, because when you have 3.2 million spectra, you do not want to look through them all manually. Uh, we did so in the beginning. And at some point, people, my students were throwing rotten eggs after me, no, not completely true, but at least mentally, uh, because I mean, they were dying in, 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 in this manual analysis. So we, we designed this software where we could do this automatically. And it's now a freeware software, which is quite commonly used uh, for, for imaging. 
So this approach for sure finds more plastics than sorting and picking. Let me illustrate how it does so. Well, there's a study by, 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 by Lee et al from 2018, which uh, investigated uh, 28 uh, wastewater treatment plants in China. It was a good study, by the way. There's no complaints about that. They used this sorting and picking uh, approach. And they concluded that there was uh, 1.56 times 10 to the 14 numbers of microplastics per year in all the sludge from China. A huge number, like, oh my, this has many zeros. Uh, but they did this sorting and picking approach. And what actually the lower size limit of that is, is unclear. Uh, Rupa, Rupa Chant et al. and uh, my lab, we analyzed a, a, a wastewater treatment plant in Sweden, the second largest in Sweden. And we found that they release approximately the same number of microplastics uh, as all of China does. So does this, oops, does this then mean that, that, uh, that uh, one Swedish wastewater treatment plant has as much plastics as all Chinese put together? No, of course not. Of course not. Uh, it just simply means that different methods have been used. And when you are you counting numbers, and if you for the Chinese slot, only accounting the big particles, maybe down to half a millimeter in size, and we count it down to 10 micrometers in, in, in size, you find a lot more small particles due to simply at that, that uh, the number of particles is, it comes in the third power of the size. So uh, you can say, yes, home safe. Now we have a method that really works and we are super good at it and we find a lot of particles, uh, but did we actually find them all? Um, I'll go a bit fast over this because otherwise I talk too long. Uh, and and uh, when we scan it, when we scan it, uh, this is a scan from, from, uh, from uh, 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 soil from a harbor. Uh, and then, uh, then we then we can see, for example, that if you zoom in on, on, on one particle here, this particle, you can see here that this is the polyethylene particle. And how can you see that? The blue one is the reference spectrum where we have made a reference spectrum for, poly, for polyethylene. And you have the, the, the orange one, which is the measured spectrum. You can see it has the same peak here. These peaks here are coming from oxidation of the, of, of, of the polyethylene. Uh, so, 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 yeah, this is a polyethylene particle. But what about this guy down here? Yeah, this is the same as this one. What about this guy down here? It gets overlooked. Why? Yeah, because you can st actually still see it's exactly the same material. You can see it just has a poorer spectrum. So, 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 this would be ignored in the analysis because the correlation is 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 poorer, right? So, yeah, we overlook. We clearly overlook uh, particles also with this technique. Um, yeah, forget that one. So we do not find them all. We do not find them all. Uh, and it's, it's really easy, not easy to, to say what the limit of quantification is in terms of size, most likely 20 to 30 micrometers, but it's very difficult to, to exactly determine. So let's be honest about that. Let's just tell what it is what the limitations are of our study. Oh, I forgot it. I mean, if you have been looking into, 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 into microplastics, also calls for funding and whatnot, you will see, oh, and we want you to measure microplastics and nanoplastics. Eh, and we want you to measure the nanos. And we want you to measure the nanoplastics. Yeah, 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 yeah. Back in, in 2011, people were already discussing, oh, you could do it this way in order to measure, micro, uh, measure the nanoplastics. But I mean, honestly, we are still not able to do it. We, we still cannot measure, uh, we, we, we can hardly measure microplastics, right? At least, I mean, we can do it down to a certain limit, maybe these 20 to 30 micrometers, maybe a bit further down, maybe 10 micrometers. But, but, but below that, we really get into problems in terms of quantification, not detection. We can always see smaller particles, but we cannot quantify how many there are. And uh, quantifying nanoplastics in complex matrices, forget it. We're not able to do that. And, and, uh, and, and, and nobody has, has hitherto uh, trustworthy been able to quantify nanoplastics in complex matrices. 
and it's it's really really super complicated and and uh, i think we have a long way to go before we get there um before i i end up i think i still have maybe five minutes i at least will talk about one of the case studies i have in my presentation um because i think it's 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 a fun story now you're sitting in some room i assume and my best guess is that each and every body of you is breathing air right i guess so so uh, we put a a person this person this nice looking person mannequin uh, in a room and let him or her whatever breathe uh, for a day for 24 hours and uh, this mannequin he is a bit handicapped so he has his lungs over here so these are the lungs of, of the mannequin and and this is very noisy so this was in flat with students because they it was their project so so they could easily live with that and then we put uh, a filter this is a is a silver filter we put in here i can't remember what size it was a, a micrometer or something like that uh, in in the airways of, of the mannequin and then we collected all the dust that was breathed in via the mannequin. And, and then you have this, this dust collected over this, uh, over this, uh, this 24 hour periods. And then we analyzed what actually was in it using our fancy machinery. And uh, what you can see here is the gray is natural particles uh, and, and, and the colors are plastics. So you can see there is quite a lot of plastics. So if you quantify it more closely, what you will see is uh, that in, in these it were three flats we investigated. And there was six percent, no, sorry, sorry, uh, four percent of the of the, of all the particles uh, in the air were plastics. So so there's a lot of plastics in in the indoor air. Oh, and what is the rest, by the way? You know, the 6% is cellulose, meaning paper, uh, cotton, and so on. And then it says here 90% is proteinous material. I don't know if you can guess what it is. It is mainly your own dead skin, because you're shedding skin all the time. So most of the dust you're breathing in is your own dead skin. And so that's always one thingy that, that people react to when I, when, when I, when I say this, right? Um, oh yeah, this is just showing the variations between the, the three flats that we found, of course, different amounts, but it was pretty consistent. Some percent was plastics and the rest were natural materials. So, so this is actually quite a quite high load. Uh, this is another fun thing which which I uh, need to need to need to say, need to say and I think this is then uh, we did a TV show and and uh, we had a uh, we had a uh, an analysis analysis going on in 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 the flat in Copenhagen where 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 this family uh, these guys over here uh, were living and and we filtered air and 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 here we found very weird very weird results because we found uh, uh, it? cellulose acetate, cellulose acetate, 26%. We, we would, we, polyester, this is very common. You find so much polyester everywhere, clothes and so on, right? But, but where does the cellulose acetate come from? Because this is normally not something we find. I mean, it, it's used in cigarette filters, uh, but they don't smoke. Yeah, and nobody smokes in that family or in that room. So uh, it turned out that, that that this guy here, the father, is his profession is is magician magician. So he does tricks on the to entertain people with different things. And because it was so boring there to sit for the and wait for eight hours for this machine to filter all there, he was showing uh, tricks. So he was using his cards and showing tricks. And uh, his magic magician cards are professional poker cards, and they are made out of, guess what? Cellulose acetate. So what you could see in the air was the fingerprint of this guy sitting and having and, and showing off with his cards. And this is the, the last slide I will then show because otherwise it takes too long time. So uh, what is actually the exposure to uh, for, for humans? Uh, on microplastics. I mean, this is just a rough estimate and, and it's not all published, but the indoor air you breathe, 
you breathe approximately 4,000 cubic meters of air per year. <clears throat> and it covers roughly maybe 20,000 pieces of plastics. Uh, again, used, you measured with the same analytical techniques, so this is not in mass as a. What about the drinking water? It has maybe a thousand times less. Maybe soft drinks, Coke and, and so on. It actually has quite a lot. So this is also a big contribution, but the air is by far the largest contribution. And food will, of course, also, also, also uh, give you a little bit of plastics. So I think I will end here because otherwise, uh, yeah, I'll go over time. So stop sharing. Okay, many thanks, uh, yes, for this nice presentation. And I hope we will have a few questions before the, the end of the session. So I, I see uh, two questions. So Emmanuel Nino, uh, you, you can raise your hand and ask your long question, please. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Gisna. No, um, thank you so much, Professor. I was wondering, um, this question of uh, methodology, finding them all or not, separating them by class or not, discussing mass versus number. I mean, this question shouldn't be limited to microplastic, right? So there must be other topics, uh, areas of research, which I'm not thinking right now, where they have the same problem and maybe they they found a solution. What, what do you... Do you have ideas about this? Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, when when you are counting uh, particles for example in air pollution, uh, you, you run into similar problems. But uh, the thing is, they only quantify in terms of uh, amounts of particles or masses of particles uh, in a certain uh, in a certain size range, for example. Uh, down to 2.5 million micrometers or one micrometer or 10 micrometer or whatever. So, 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 uh, so when you're doing microplastics, you go, you, you are going uh, somewhat, somewhat deeper into it. Uh, so, so, but, but there are some, some similar things there. Another thing where you maybe could say that there is, is, is a, a, a um, a similarity is, is in microbiology when you are when you're for example counting algae or bacteria or whatnot you're also running into very similar problems in many ways uh, in order to when when you are quantifying so so it's true it's it's not a unique uh, phenomena for plastics uh, but but um, and yeah but we have some additional problems uh, because uh, also the, the, what is plastic is actually not very well defined. Uh, is for example, how much plastics do need to be in plastics in order to be plastic? For example, a paint flake, which maybe has 20% uh, polymer background, is that plastic or not? And so on. But yes, there's, there's, there's of course other fields, fields which have, it, uh, have addressed this, but, but, uh, uh, but it has like, getting much more um, pronounced for microplastics than for many other areas. Nan nanomaterials, of course, also have similar issues. Okay, very good. I have a, a second question from uh, Gemma Müller. I, I don't know if I pronounce really well. If you can uh, ask your question, please. Hi, I just want to know about the uh, automated um, polymer identification system you use. Um, did you say it was a free resource? Yes. What's it called? Uh, simple. Uh, it is. It is. It is. Uh, it is uh, a, a software which which uh, we made together with the uh, Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany. And uh, th think about w w when when you're taking a uh, when you're taking a scan, it's basically like taking an, 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 a digital photo, and for each pixel in the digital photo, instead of having a color, you have an IR spectrum, and then you use that to process the images. Uh, so 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 uh, so when you have these sorts of these um, uh, these spectrum-based images. Uh, uh, this software we developed for that, and then uh, it works on 
four or five different uh, vendors of, of, of hardware, Edgeland, Thermo Scientific, uh, and so on, Baruka. Thank you. Do you use that with um, like a linear array? Like you can, use, uh, you can use both a linear array and you can use an FPA, a focal plane array. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. Uh, any more questions, please? Uh, you can post it in, in the chat or you can raise your hand and ask your question. We, we have time, maybe 10 minutes to, to continue the discussion with yes. Okay, so if nobody has, um, I can always say something. What I, what I, what I think is has been important for, for for our success in all book, is that we are cross disciplinary. I mean, uh, I always feel, wondered what I am actually good at, uh, and, and 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 I know many different things. We up here know many different things, but but not to super deep depth, and but combining them and bringing them together. Right? You don't find many marine biologists who are able to code, a, to, to code and make a program which other people can use, for example, or to, or to build a, 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 a deep, deep water system. We have technicians that can do this and work together. So, so this, 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 this uh, cross between many different disciplines, I think this is really the strength of what we are doing. Yeah, I, I see. So I think we, we need... Uh... Uh, a multidisciplinary approach to to address this uh, very very big uh, challenge. Uh, I have another question from uh, Julia Dussosi. You can ask your question, please. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. I am a PhD student working on microplastics in uh, French Alpine lakes. I am uh, therefore uh, encountering all the difficulties that you have just presented. And I would like to know your main advice in order to carry out a study on microplastics that is as accurate as possible with the current possibilities. So sorry, I, I didn't quite get the last part. Could you repeat it and maybe a bit closer to the microphone? Oh, sorry. I said um, I am therefore encountering all the difficulties that you have just presented. And I would like to know your main advice in order to carry out a study on microplastics that is as accurate as possible with the current possibilities. Hmm. I, I think I think you can you can you can do good studies, also with limited instrumentation. You just have to be uh, to document and prove what it actually is you did, and 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 to 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 what levels. So so so. Uh, um, I think don't oversell it. I mean, uh, once upon the time I saw a study uh, as a reviewer who, who uh, they said they had analyzed or quantified microplastics down to one micrometer using a microscope, which is gaga. So, 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 so that's a no-go. But had they said that we are doing this down to, to, to 300 or 500 micrometers and we prove that we can do this, by, for, for example, spiking a, a known amount of material and recovering it, and so on, then I would have been totally happy. So, so, so even with with uh, the old methods like a microscope and a hot needle, uh, you would still be able to do a decent study as long as you do it systematic and are rigorous and are able to to uh, to uh, to show that what you actually measure is 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 the correct thing. Uh, so, so, so uh, I think I think this is this is an important part. So you don't necessarily have to have a huge machine park uh, in order to do it. Okay, Kate. Uh, any more question, please? We have uh, time. Yes, again, uh, Gemma Müller. Hi. Um, do you think we should? Uh wait for standardization of methodology and reporting or just uh, continue to use different systems? Yeah, again, I mean, why do you want to do standardization? I mean, if, if, you, if you're monitoring the marine environment and all the Mediterranean Sea, for example, then you have to have a standardized method because otherwise you can't compare what you found in the East and in the West. That's totally okay. 
But if you are investigating, for example, the impacts uh, on, on, on whatever a fish, or if you are investigating a process of breakdown, you don't need a standardized method uh, because the standard method might actually be, uh, be hampering your work. Uh, you need a method that meets your demands, your requirements, and then you need to be able to show that this works. So, 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 and 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 by the way, the 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 way the standardization is going is, uh, oh, do you call it the same? Uh, the lowest common denominator. So, so that it is, it is the standardization will be uh, very. Uh, um, I mean, this is what everybody would be able to do, at least to some degree, sort of thing, but not necessarily what, what science needs. So, 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 no, I am not waiting for standardization. I mean, they are far behind what we're doing. That's good. Uh, we have, I think it's a comment from uh, uh, Maxime, who thanks you a lot for this really interesting presentation, but really scary in the same time. So. Especially the indoor <laughs> air thing, right? Yeah, I mean, yes. this, is, this, is, this is something which, which, which I think people have to, to remember that, that microplastics is something that goes directly into the heart of people. It's so easy to scare people with it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and that's also why we have to quantify and I could also have talked uh, talked about the discussion, the, the topic in a different way. I could have said that when we went to Greenland, what we actually found out was that uh, only one particle in a million was plastics. So the probability of a fish or a copepode or whatever to take up this plastic once in its lifetime is very low. So, 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 so it depends on how we talk about it, right? But it's a topic which is super easy to scare the public with. Mm. And then this indoor air thing is, is really one of the good ones. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and yeah, I think you, what, 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 what do you think about, um, because we, we have a, a tricky uh, question also about the morphology or the, the shape or these microplastics, because you have sometimes the fragments, sometimes the fibers. And uh, what, what do you uh, find mainly in the marine uh, area, for example? Well, yeah. Do you have maybe more? Yeah, all, all, all morphologies, I think. But Yeah, it depends on the sizes again. I mean, if, if for the bigger particles, for the bigger sizes, you find a lot of fibers. Uh, when you go into like a size range bit below 100 micrometers, it's not very many fibers. It's mainly fragments. It might be fragments of fibers, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, so, 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 uh, but but shapes matters. That is that is that is pretty clear. Um, and then if if you can take the the the, the indoor air thing in, in 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 mind, I mean a thin long fiber is more toxic than a, a sphere, for example, right? Mm. So, 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 uh, but it tends to be fragments uh, when we go uh, into smaller sizes. Yeah, because the, 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 I think the shape is really important also for the transport of these yes. um, uh, items. Yeah, it's good. Um, uh, any more questions, please, from the virtual audience? <laughs> Maybe we, we have, uh, I don't know, uh, Claire Lise, maybe we have. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, we have a question uh, from Ogba. Ah, sorry. I, 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 yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't see. Sabawi. Yes, Ogba, you can uh, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was wondering in your last slide, uh, you it was shown that um, there is more microplastics in soft drinks than in drinking water. Um, is the drinking water from tap water or also from plastic uh, water bottle? No, no, no. This is tap tap water. Okay. Uh, actually, the the data is 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 mainly based on 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 uh, water close to the drinking water plant or in the pipelines, and and uh, the reason why you you find more maybe depends of course on on the water sources, right? But maybe factor hundred or more more in in, in the bottled water. 
is because of uh, the of 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 the pipings at, at, at the tree at the at the processing plant of the cleanings with the brushes uh, and so on that all gives you you your plastics into into the the soft drinks okay thank you <laughs> 